Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! It kind of prompted me to wonder whether we might get away with doing a few calls on when you have actually been blood-curdlingly frightened. I, 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 I like that sort of stuff. Goodness knows. Brexit would not be permitted, no. You wouldn't be allowed to ring me up and say, yeah, God, James, seriously, you think that fellow who nearly fell off a hang glider was scared? Well, I live in a country that's about to impose economic sanctions on it, so no, that, that would not be permitted. Um, we may talk about some footage you may have seen of a Syrian refugee being appallingly abused on a Huddersfield playing field, but I... The, 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 the bully is apparently 16 years old, and... If I sat here, and this is a problem with the footballification of everything, isn't it? I feel sorry for 16-year-olds who do really vile and dangerous things because I don't believe that 16 is an age at which you have arrived in that vile and dangerous place entirely of your own volition. I, I believe you have been radicalised. But if I sat here on the morning after a terror attack undertaken by a teenage fundamentalist or, or indeed a teenage white supremacist and sought to defend or, or, or accept explain their behaviour on the grounds of radicalisation. I, I don't know what sort of reception I'd get. I suppose it would depend on, for many people, tragically, it would depend on whether it was a white supremacist teenage terrorist or whether it was actually an Islamist fundamentalist teenage terrorist, whereas regular listeners to this programme will know we will only be in a better place and safer when we react identically to identical crimes, regardless of the ethnicity or motivation of the culprit. So... So I look at this Syrian refugee who already had a fractured arm as the result of a previous attack. I think we're putting the footage up on the website. Um, and I also feel sorry for the bully. That's the kind of snowflake I am. So I don't know quite where the conversation would go. I'll put that one on hold. It's only Wednesday. We'll have till the end of the week. If charges are brought, of course, we won't be able to talk about it. But I want you to be aware of the story. The other story that you will be aware of by now, I hope, is the um, uh, Rotherham rape victim who has waived her rights to anonymity, Sammy Woodhouse, speaking out incredulously about her rapist being offered access to her son, who, who was born as a, as a result of rape. And again, I, I, I mean, you just have to hope it's a mistake, because if this is some sort of systemic flaw within Rotherham Council's bureaucracy, then heads need to roll, but I'm going to wait again on that one until I know whether or not it is actually a mistake, a glitch in the system that needs to be excised immediately, or whether it speaks of a broader policy, in which case it's time to man the barricades. What an incredibly brave woman she is. Seven minutes after ten is the time, and some of the other stuff that we may have a little look at if we have the chance includes how on earth have we ended up living in a country where it's cheaper to get a plane ticket to Australia in some circumstances than it is to get a return ticket from London to Manchester and um, well David Beckham is in the news for giving his daughter a kiss I, I don't know that I can manufacture any outrage about the idea of a man kissing his little girl on the lips I didn't even realise that was questionable but as I say there's a lot to get through today. Um, oh, and there's some vegans. I always like a bit of vegans in the news. This occasion sees them storming a steakhouse and playing the sounds of cows being slaughtered, which is actually my introduction to vegetarianism, was meet his murder by Morrissey, by the Smiths, before Morrissey went bonkers. And that indeed did contain the soundtrack, apparently, of cows being slaughtered. Didn't work on me. So there's lots to choose from. Uh, let me know if you've got any preferences from that particular menu of conversations. Um, it annoys the hell out of Sheila Fogarty when I do this. She, of course, has to decide what she's going to talk about at one o'clock. So hurry up, tell me what you want to talk about today, and we'll do our best to meet your needs. We begin, inevitably, with Brexit. Two and a half years. Um, two and a half years later the thing that some of us have been saying all along has now come true. We, we are deliberately making ourselves poorer in order to address or uh, float the vain hope that individuals' xenophobia could somehow be cured by state sanctioned xenophobia. There's a reason why Theresa May's deal, when she trumpets it, she begins always by talking about how for once and for all we're abolishing free movement because that is, whether you like it or not, that is the only 
tangible thing she can point at. Everything else is prediction or forecast, right? So she knows this. So she can sit there and say, she could lie and say that there are economic forecasts that are positive and there are people, of course, so embedded in their delusion and, and so in denial about their deception that they would cheer her along. There'll be people on the other side still claiming that there's an alternative despite not being able to tell you what it is. But what Theresa May, I think I finally worked it out. I've been close to working it out previously. I've sort of looked through the letterbox of working it out. But it, it's hard sometimes to believe that the scale of the stupidity that the country has been, um, what's the word I want, entranced by. So here's what happened. Theresa May's not a massive fan of the European Union, but she's a pragmatist. This is not an I feel sorry for Theresa May topic, I promise you, but bear with. She is not a massive fan of the European Union. She's also, I think, a little bit of a jingoist. She, she has a Middle England 1950s style attitude to foreigners, or queue jumpers, as she likes to call them. Some foreigners are queue jumpers. Uh, she also, of course, as we saw during the Windrush revelations, does subscribe to a school of thought that imposes a hierarchy of humanity upon people depending upon the geography of their birth. Uh, I am worth more, in Theresa May's eyes, because I was born in Britain to white parents than you are, in Theresa May's eyes, if you were born in Britain to black parents. That is, I'm afraid, pretty much unavoidable. And it's a far from uncommon position, of course. It's only relatively recently that people have felt empowered to say such things in public when we were all enslaved by the yoke of political correctness you weren't allowed to be racist in public but you are now as indeed that playing field in Huddersfield so poignantly reminds us we're teaching our children that it's okay as well of course so she wasn't a massive fan of the European Union she wanted to be Prime Minister and she took the job knowing that it was going to end up here this is the crucial point. Any understanding whatsoever of the detail contained within the Good Friday Agreement, the four pillars that underpin the freedoms, the four freedoms that underpin the European Union, and the desire to end freedom of movement, this is crucial for all the talk of EFTA and EEA and Norway Plus and Switzerland that you know and I know that they would not have got over that line without the anti-immigration vote. Call it racist if you want, or call it simply anti-immigration. Even Farage went on the record saying he didn't mind being poorer. This is, everyone forgets this. He said before the vote, I would not mind being poorer if there were few for, fewer foreigners around. And now you sit here and you say, well, this is all about being poorer. People prepared to be poorer if they think there'll be fewer foreigners around. That's absolutely ridiculous. He was the leader of UKIP when he said it, you know, before he unveiled that poster. The Breaking Point poster, which was a uh, Nazi-themed incitement to racial hatred, of course. Echoes of Joseph Goebbels' work, clear to the naked eye. It's perfectly possible he hadn't seen Joseph Goebbels' work when the agency put that in front of him. But I have, and I can tell you there are massive, massive, massive similarities. So, there were people... I suppose I've just found myself in the slightly odd position of, of defending Nigel Farage on the grounds that he said all along that the country was going to be poorer, but it was worth it because there would be fewer foreigners. Now people who voted for Brexit, possibly after his interventions, are denying that that was ever the case at all. That was the weirdest morning, wasn't it, when people started ringing me up saying they didn't mind if their children lost their jobs or they didn't mind if they were poorer. It, it would somehow be worth it. And they talked about sovereignty and control without knowing what either word meant. And, and ultimately, in terms of something tangible, something measurable, something that Theresa May will actually be able to point to and say, this would not have happened without Brexit, all you've got is the abolition of freedom of movement. That is literally the only codified, formal, written-down thing she can sell to the public. Whether or not it's enough, I still don't know. But as soon as freedom of movement became weaponized in the run-up to the referendum, all roads were going to lead to here. Now, I don't dislike you or, 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 or despise you or feel disgusted by you if you're still in denial about that, if you still think that it could have ended up somewhere else. It could if we hadn't weaponized freedom of movement. But the weaponization of freedom of movement, plus the Good Friday Agreement, plus the Four Freedoms, plus the Red Lines, means that we could never have ended up anywhere else but with the deal we've currently got. So, what's the new thing I've worked out? Well, Theresa May's epic error of the last two years 
was to believe that eventually the likes of Boris Johnson and David Davis would have to concede reality. She presumed that if they were nose to the grindstone, if they were in the inner sanctum, not necessarily responsible for the negotiations, but absolutely party to the realities of those negotiations, then there would come a point when they would have to turn around and say, yeah, OK, this is the best deal that we would ever be able to get. She presumed that by putting them in the cabinet and by giving them these incredibly powerful jobs and titles, Liam Fox on the list as well, although he seems to have fallen into line, he seems to have at least on some level accepted reality. She presumed that they would have to join her. Now, I don't know what she thought would happen next, whether she thought there would be a retreat or a reversal. I suspect not, to be honest with you, but I think she felt... If, if reality became utterly undeniable, then they'd have to come with me when the deal is eventually done. And that was her biggest mistake. That, that, that emerged after checkers when Davis and Boris Johnson chose to walk the plank and continue lying as opposed to accepting the absolute reality of the situation into which they have thrust this utterly undeserving population. So that's the problem now. Because she thought when this deal came to Parliament, it would be impossible for the ringleaders of Brexit to argue that there could be something better on the table. She could cope with Jeremy Corbyn arguing it because Jeremy Corbyn lacks credibility. So for him to stand up and say, oh, I've got a better deal, but I can't tell you what it is yet, that she could just about accommodate. And with the slavish press behind her, she could probably have pulled that off. But what she needed to do and we'll see whether she gets it through Parliament or not, but to be sure of getting it through Parliament, she needed the heavy hitters to have accepted simple reality. And that's why she put them in the front of the car. And they've let her down. She could cope with an Ian Duncan Smith, uh, a, a, a kind of lunatic fringe type politician, claiming that there was sunny uplands as yet undecided or undescribed, but somehow attainable. She could cope with the European research group. She obviously understood how much power they really wielded rather better than they did. The nonsensical politician Steve Baker, claiming to have 80, 90, 100 people ready to chuck her under a bus, is now culling his own WhatsApp group of people whose ideology isn't pure enough. Apparently 30 MPs have been removed from that ERG WhatsApp group which Nadine Dorries used to ask whether anyone could explain to her what the customs union was because she kept losing arguments about why it was a good idea to leave the customs union. See? It was a clue of how surreal things were becoming. So Theresa May thought that they would have to fall into line behind her. She could deal with the outliers like Rhys Mogg and Duncan Smith. She could deal with the opposition like Corbyn and MacDonald. But she needed to bring in the big beasts of Brexit, particularly Boris Johnson, who could, of course, have jumped either way, but elected for reasons of pure self-interest to back leave. She presumed that if they were presented with a large piece of moon rock, they would have to stop claiming that the moon was made of cheese. So she gave them both moon rock and she got it horribly wrong because they gave the moon rock back when they resigned and marched to the newspapers claiming still that the moon was made of cheese, that unicorns are on the horizon, that you can have cake and simultaneously somehow eat it. And that's why we are where we are. I'm Beth's whispering in my ear about how late we are for the next break, but I've got about 20 minutes more material prepared on this. So that's why we are where we are. It's that simple. So who's left? People who have recognised reality, OK? Whether you're a Lever or a Remainer, this is as good a deal as anyone was ever going to get. Or people who haven't recognised reality, who are still buying into the notion that if Theresa May hadn't been a Ramona, or if somehow the hands hadn't been tied, we could have secured an unspecified but utterly brilliant arrangement with 27 countries who remain adamant that we couldn't have done. That's how mad things have become. So here's the question, maybe, today. I don't know. We might work towards something else. But if you are still... Um, let's have a quick look at the board here. Billy says, predictions of economic growth are of no use. Um, May's deal has always been dead in the water. So if you're still buying into the idea that there was something better on the table, what would have had to have happened in the last two years for you to have accepted that there wasn't? Do you see what I mean? So you, you can say, well, we should have put Farage in charge. He said all along that we were going to be poorer, but it was worth it to have fewer foreigners around. 
Uh, you could call that racism if you want. I do, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that is what it is. You could have put Rhys Mogg in charge, a man whose economic advice is um, adamant that any supposed gains at the till would be offset by the absolute destruction of British industry and agriculture. So you could have Rhys Mogg in charge, end of industry and agriculture. You could have Farage in charge. I don't mind being poorer as long as there are fewer Johnny foreigners around. You could have Boris Johnson in charge, a man who knows that we should remain in the European Union but thought that campaigning to leave would improve his chances of being Prime Minister. Or you could have David Davis in charge, who had two years to negotiate the better deal and came away with precisely nothing. Do you see how clear it is? Why is anyone still in denial? I, I'm sort of cautiously suggesting that we've reached a point of agreement again. It's like on the morning after the referendum when I said the one thing we can all agree on is that nobody knows what happens next. I would put it to you as the Chancellor tours the studios of the United Kingdom explaining that we are deliberately making ourselves poorer and the Prime Minister explains that the trade-off, the payoff, the result is the abolition of freedom of movement for once and for all. Can we now all agree that Brexit was always about making ourselves poorer in the hope of seeing fewer foreigners around. 03456060973, something which, I, of course, it's always dangerous to use Farage as an example because he says the polar opposite on a Tuesday of what he said on a Monday. So May 2015, we would be substantially better off not being in the EU. May 2018, I never said it would be a beneficial thing to leave and everyone would be better off. A kind of definition of a liar there. Vote for Brexit for a better quality of life, April 2016. May 2018, I never said it would be a beneficial thing to leave and everyone would be better off. And the worst case scenario economically is better than where we are now. That was June 2016. May 2018, I never said it would be a beneficial thing to leave and everyone would be better off. And the people who've believed his lies don't mind because they honestly think that being poorer is a price worth paying for the chance, the possibility, the hope of Johnny Foreigner being a little thinner on the ground. And that's all it ever was. So we can all pack up and go home now. Well done. I don't think it will work. I don't think you will wake up the morning after we leave feeling less racist, regardless of how many foreigners are living on your street or um, supposedly sleeping in your doorways. You'll still be a massive racist. You'll still be angry, but you'll be poorer. Great. Clint's in Croydon. Clint, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning to you. Uh, right, OK, first and foremost, I would like to say that I was an amber Brexiteer. I voted no. I didn't want to stay with the EU. Mm. So uh, I didn't vote for a deal. I voted to leave. I understand that when the um, Remainers stood up and, and voiced uh, Cameron, etc., it was all about GDP, 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 GDP. It was all that was all it was about. There was nothing about the country and people's feelings. No, there was the loads about what the economic it. impact would be on yeah. each individual but, but, family, wasn't there? So, no, Clint, I, I'm happy to listen to you, but if you say something that's not true, my job is to, to stop you and correct you. There was an awful lot from Mark Carney, from George Osborne, from David Cameron, from lots of other Leave campaigners explaining what the economic impact would be personally, explaining the possibility of factories closing, explaining what the actual sum of money reduced from each individual family budget would be. So there was also talk about GDP, but what you just no, said no. isn't true. I understand that, Good. but obviously it was all speculative. But the reality is, that's not really why I'm calling. The, the situation well, then, then, is then the why not start with the reason why you are calling, instead of starting with the reason why you're not calling, being corrected, and then somehow trying to gloss over the mistake that you just made? Well, I don't feel I have made a mistake. Okay. So, I'll uh, say it again. Frequently, okay. throughout the referendum campaign, people were told about prices going up in shops, about a reduction in their personal expenditure capabilities, about the precise sum of money which each family could potentially lose. That is not GDP. That is personal budgetary explanation. So when of you said it was it all about GDP and they never mentioned anything else, you were just okay. wrong, my friend. So let's okay. scratch that right. and start well, again. Distinguishing between GDP, it was, about, it was never about how people... Oh, they can't get into the doctors, dentists, all those other things. That no, that's immigration. That's nothing anyway, to do with economics. Okay, if I can get to the point of why I'm calling, because I accept <laughs> we are where we are. Yes. Uh, from what I can understand, the big problem is the backstop. Now, <clears throat> the dangers are, according to what we're understanding on the media, is that we could be caught 
and the EU are going to control exactly when we can possibly leave that. No, the, 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 the arrangement is, and I completely sympathise with your failure to understand this because you're having all sorts of nonsense poured into your ears by all sorts of people. There is a group of Brexiteers, as you like to call yourself, who claim that it's really, really easy to solve the problem of the Irish border, but they are simultaneously furious about the suggestion that we can't fully cut our ties with the European Union until that solution to the Irish border has been put in place. So the people you're in bed with are arguing on the one hand that it's really, really easy to do it, and on the other hand that we can't have doing it as a condition of leaving. So there is a contradiction there that I hope now I've explained it, Clint. Yeah. You can see very clearly. Yeah, for sure. I'm not... Excited. Well, tell me what I just said, Clint. 100% it's not easy. Clint, tell me what I just said. OK, well, can I just suggest... No, because I'm not sure you're listening. And if you're not I, listening I to am. what I'm saying, this isn't a conversation. So what did I just say you're about the... You're saying that the Brexiteers, yes. which I believe I am one of them, yes. think it's very, very simple to solve. No, they don't think it is. They know it isn't. They're lying and saying that it's very simple okay. to solve. Well, obviously, that's your opinion. No, I OK, so what's that's the simple right. solution, but then? What, I, what I'm suggesting, or asking whether it is feasible, yeah. is that if both the EU and the UK were to put down their criteria required for the backstop to... No, it doesn't finish. work like that. The, 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 the criteria required for the backstop to finish is regulatory alignment on both sides of the Irish border, as enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement. Which can't be... Which is already written down. Moment. Which is Well, it can be achieved at the moment, according to the people you support. But they just won't tell you how it can be achieved, and they'll say, we can't possibly sign up to something that requires it to be achieved, even though it's really easy to achieve it. Do you not feel yet, during this conversation, that you've been mugged? No, I don't. OK, I, so I, the solution I mean, is I, simple, but they don't know what it is. Well, it has okay. to be in place before we can leave, and they're objecting to well, the well, idea that it has to be in place before we can leave, despite... No, you oh, here we go. This is why I wanted you to repeat Parliament back to me what I've said, because now you're just doing platitudes. I've explained I'm to you not, what's going it, on. It, I mean, the thing is, it is a phone-in show, and all I'm asking is to be heard. No, Clint, you phoned in and said fine. one thing. I pointed out it was wrong. You said that wasn't why you phoned in. You said something else. I've pointed no, I out why it was wrong, and I, now you're insisting on being no, heard. Start, so no, you I carry on. Fill your boots. i who I was and what I believe. No, okay? but it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not if I can prove that it's not true, Clint. ...that disagree with the, the, the deal that... Theresa May is trying to put this country in. Okay? Yes, but so they, 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 all they've got, Clint, heard. is the a idea... Oh, Clint, party you keep country talking, mate. ...could be oversee the situation, that then nobody would change it for their own you advantage. Mean, you mean a supranational institution like the European Court of Justice, for example? No, 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 oh, an what, what then? A country, maybe to put it to a country like Canada. Or right, Australia, so we take back control <laughs> by putting Canada in charge of Brexit. Well, I'm not saying that. That isn't what I said. What did I you said, say then, Clint? Because those are the words I heard. No, well, if you can listen... Yes, I am listening, I Clint. Said the backstop seems to be the problem. I accept... The problem with what, Clint? Theresa May has done a deal, but the problem oh, seems Clint. to be from both parties... I tell you what, mate, you are not making my day. The problem... Yes. Because obviously, you, you know, you, you believe what you believe. But no, 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 no. Belief plays no do. part. Be and belief that, plays no part in my position, Clint. This is where you and I diverge, you see. You ring me up and you tell me that the uh, backstop is the problem and that Canada should somehow be in charge of overseeing it. I say to you, so you want Canada to be in charge of Brexit. You say, no, I never said that. Then you tell me that you believe there's something better out there. I explain to you why there isn't. You say, well, I believe there is, but I can't tell you what it is. And then you say, well, you believe something different. And I now say to you, I don't believe something different. I understand the facts of the matter. You believe that they're not facts. And I wonder what it would take for you to recognise that your beliefs are bogus. And I suspect there's nothing at all that could do that, Clint. Yes, what? I believe yours are. Yes, but I've just explained why they're not, with reference to the treaty the Good Friday Agreement, with reference to the enshrined necessity of regulatory alignment, with the observation that this supranational body that you want to preside over Brexit would not involve taking back control, it would involve giving it to a third party. You suggested Canada, I suggested the European Court of Justice. Every single thing I've said is a recorded, demonstrable fact, and all you keep saying to me is, I believe that you're wrong. The bottom line, my friend, is that I'm not. So, um...
there are two positions left, really, on the Brexit side. There's the belief that things could be better, even though you can't explain how. And you can't beat up people like Clint for still subscribing to that school of thought when the likes of Boris Johnson and David Davis are still punting it. Or there's what Philip Hammond has described this morning, which is, yeah, we will be poorer, but if there's fewer foreigners around, it will be worth it. Philip Hammond doesn't believe that. Theresa May, I suspect, probably does. But, of course, they won't be the ones that are poorer. It will be, as all the economic forecasts that the government publishes today show, it will be the poorest people who suffer the most from the economic impact of Brexit. So there we are. Which are you? Are you someone who's still buying into the beliefs, like Clint, or are you someone who has been described by the Chancellor accurately this morning as accepting economic hardship because you think there might be fewer foreigners around? And that's fine. It's just that you all owe me an apology for saying that that's where it was going to end up two and a half years ago. 38 minutes after 10. Ian is in Harlow. Which are you, Ian? Oh, uh, morning, James. Well, um, I don't know what I am, really. I'm, I'm, I'm you're, you're still pro-Brexit. Is it because you think there's a better deal possible, or is it because you don't care if people get poorer as long as there are fewer foreigners around? Well, I think it's, it's, you're going up the wrong, barking up the wrong tree a little bit. Go on. The thing is, I think that uh, Theresa May has latched on to the original reason why I think working-class people voted for Brexit and why probably middle- to upper-class people voted for Brexit, which... Which is what? Which is that the people that, um... Go on, yeah? No? Can we try and get Ian back? I think that's just the phone line. Paul's in Bristol. Paul, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Good Hello. morning. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have to be really honest with you. Um, post the um, uh, referendum, I, I used to really... It used to grate me, your radio show. I, I apologise for that. And um, right. I've actually come through this whole process of actually come to the point of going, actually, I think you were right. And it, this is some kind of lunacy and insanity. Um, Except it's not. It is, it is, there is a logic to thinking that it's all right being poorer if there are fewer foreigners around. The, 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 that's not uh, insane. I, it's, it's unpleasant well, and it's, ugly, and it's probably not going to deliver the promises that people are hoping, but it's not mad. It's not like saying, I believe there's something better, but I can't tell you what it is, which is the other option. Well, I think people should make calculated decisions, and um, if you... Um, I was sitting with a, uh, a group of my team this week, and of which some of them are um, some uh, Polish workers. Yeah. And um, I, I just thought to myself, "What are we doing? These are great people. You know, w w what's happening here?" Um, and well, they, they're, they're, they're taking up too much space. I think would be the response from from the. I don't mind being poorer as long as there are fewer foreigners around. I think that's okay if you can believe in the other. It's sort of you have to create like the other, this uh, person that you don't know um, that's coming to harm you. But when you think of people as individuals, it's very difficult to continue in that train of thought. Um, which is why the media think, puts so much effort into making people not think of them as individuals, which is how a little kid with a broken arm can get his head kicked in by a racist thug in a school playing field in, in Yorkshire. What did you think was going to happen, Paul? Well, I was a Remainer, yeah. um, but, you know, obviously when, um, after the referendum, I thought, okay, we'll give these guys a go, they, you know, hopefully they'll be able to do something. Um, but I think basically, um, and I might be wrong with uh, by saying this, but it's just such a poor reflection on the kind of leadership we have. Um, I disagree with no you on that. The, 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 it could not have gone better. Unless we retained freedom no, no, no. of movement. I, I, I'm not suggesting that it could have it, but it's this kind of the promises that people were told. Oh, yes. um, you know, there was like, it was such a lot of overreach instead of just being more measured and, you know, and clear about it. And I think a lot of people said, yeah, yeah, you know, we're going to get all this stuff. Um, and um, it's just not going to happen. Um, and I think loads of people are going to get hurt in the process. Um, and and, but at what knows, point does that pain, does that, I mean, if, if we end up seeing a, a, a reduction in immigration, um, as seems pretty likely if they bring in this £30,000 threshold, m most people in the country would fall below that, whatever their geographical origins are. Um, of course, what people never mention is that they are customers as well. <laughs> That's fewer customers for every business. What do we want? Fewer customers. What do we want? Fewer taxpayers. So at what point do people 
recognise that they've actually hurt themselves because my fear is, of course, that what happens next is they won't blame themselves for hurting themselves. They'll somehow try to blame someone else, probably the EU still, even though we won't be in it anymore, or, or the Remainers that sabotaged the plan that they still can't tell us, but which would have been absolutely brilliant if only they'd got around to telling us what it was. Well, in the city like Bristol, I mean, I run a big business um, and um, in, in um, social care, yes. and it's it's becoming quite difficult now because you cannot get staff, and it's not as though yeah. But at least the queues at the GPs will be shorter. You see, Paul, you might you might go bust, and the people that are in your care might have to find somewhere else to live. But at least the staff that you would have employed but now won't because of Brexit won't be going to our schools and clogging up our surgeries, Paul. Well, the thing is, is that um, people like us won't go bust. The price of care will just increase, which mm. means it'll affect everybody more. Well, that's great. Um, so that means your staff will get higher wages. Well, they are getting high wages at the moment, yes. which is, you know... It, it, and you're still struggling to fill spaces. I mean, I guess the market will write itself at some level. Um, it's just, you know... I hope so. It's a tragic situation that we're in. But, um, well, it's tragic for I you, it's tragic for me, it's tragic for anybody with their eyes open, but if your eyes are still closed and your fingers are still crossed and you still believe that things could have been better, it's not tragic, it's actually infuriating. You feel betrayed and let down, not by the people who have lied to you, but oddly by the people who've been telling you for two and a half years that what's happening now was inevitable. So the only people left are the ones that I think, I genuinely think this, I know I'm sounding cheeky, but when you take Hammond's comments about the economy and May's comments about freedom of movement, the calculation is we as a country are going to make ourselves poorer in order, hopefully, to make people who think there are too many foreigners stop thinking that there are too many foreigners around. History suggests that is unlikely to work. The, the xenophobic and racist and jingoistic tendencies run a lot deeper in the sections of this country where there is very low immigration. But we are where we are. Let's go back to Ian. I think we've improved that phone line. Go on, Ian. You were telling me I was barking up the wrong tree. Well, is that as far as I got? Because I, I didn't was. actually carry on for about another two, three sentences. No, it's just not fair. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Carry on. Um, yeah, what it, what, it, what it is, James, is, is the people that are, I think, are middle to the, are the upper classes want to take back control, sovereignty, etc., etc. No, the, 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 uh, sorry to the interrupt. The, de the demographics show that that sort of Daily Mail middle class constituency is more anti-immigration than what you refer to as the working class. The working class live in big cities and, and work alongside immigrants and are generally a lot more relaxed Absolutely about it. Absolutely right. Yeah. The middle well, classes, the middle classes in the home counties of middle England who delivered the Brexit vote are the ones who think that there are hordes of faceless migrants over every hill about to march into their villages and steal all their conquers. Where did you get that information from? So you can find the, the numbers in actually... You can who, find anything uh, for anything, really, actually. No, if you, if you break down the... You well, hang on, you asked me a question. Little. Well, you see, no, you I just... No, I didn't ask. You asked me what I thought. No, you said, where did you get that information from? And then you said, well, you can get information wherever you want. I just tell you what my oh, belief is. No, so we're back to... No, before I even got to that point... We're back to I, evidence I was versus belief. To explain, yeah, go on, then. I'm trying to explain the reasoning behind... Yes. Uh, where, ...where we're at at the moment. Yes, and you began with a mistake, which is fine, but carry on. I believe that Theresa May has latched on to the fact that uh, working, most working class people voted for Brexit for more for infrastructural reasons than anything else. Right. Which is to do with the fact that the, all the governments over the previous years have completely and utterly uh, uh, lacked investment in any of the, our infrastructure, whilst at the same time... Well, that's austerity, isn't it? Privatising. Well, they were doing it before 2008. But it's nothing to do with European Union membership. <clears throat> No, well, this is the point. This is where it's getting all conflated and conflicted. The fact right. is, um, I believe that at the end of the day, um, it comes down to space, not race. Yes, I said and to that, the last fella, actually. I said to the last fella it's about really space. What, what, I would love, yes. what I would love is for um, people on the left-hand side of politics uh, to realise that um, it's, it's, it's actually a combination of immigration, old age, and lack of money from previous governments over the last 40 years that have led us to this situation right now. And how That's do you think the situation the will be... Right, hang on, no, right I'd hand like to hear from... I just want well, to ask you a let question. Let me finish. Oh, just okay, finish, yep, do absolutely. The side. Carry on. Right, the left-hand side want to blame um, uh, old age and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. No. And the right-hand side blame immigration. And that's where we're at. Okay, so uh, just out of interest, how do you think we're going to be able to improve public spending and infrastructure by reducing the amount of money the government has to spend. The, the, the point is, again, and I know it's a subject that you've covered. Please, uh, please have a crack at the question I've asked, mate. Growth. Growth. Pardon? We need, to, we need to get away from this idea of growth. 
right. and how we celebrate uh, uh, Apple achieving £700 billion pound you, profits. We're, we're not on dissimilar hymn sheets here, although I don't really understand no, your, your left-right distinction. We, but no, I, I need to ask you, no, you, mate, I've let you have a crack. I just want you to have a go at answering my question. Self, no? Self-sustainability. <sighs> right. So, what, growing our own food and stuff? No, just being self-sustained rather than this greed for more. Yeah, but more, put more, some more. flesh on the bones of self-sustainability. Well, you see, this is getting very, very deep. I'm, I'm just well, it's not my really. Eye, it's just some words well, that is, you've yeah, used. I'm thing, asking what they mean. The thing is, these people have had two years to come up with a solution and still haven't. They have. So they have, come up with the only just, solution available. I'm just a cab Ian. driver who's trying to tell you my observations. And I'm just asking I'm what sorry. the words you use mean. So self-sustainability, what does that mean? Um, well, for some reason, we've got this uh, idea that the achievement in life is to keep getting as many millions as possible. Yeah, and who bankrolled Brexit? I'm not, not really interested in that, James. I'm talking you about... Have to be interested. You have to be interested in who bankrolled it, mate, because the people who bankrolled it are the people who've created precisely the economic circumstances that you're criticising. Well, I, I believe... They, they own the Ritz, the Ian. They Union own the Ritz. for corporations than anything else. Right. And, no, and I'll ask history. you to explain that, and you'll say, I don't know why, I'm just a bloke in a cab. You can't expect me to explain my opinions. Yeah. So I'll ask you one more time, how are we going to improve infrastructure and public spending by having less money to spend on the public, Ian? Yeah, but there it is. It's never been, hasn't it? Does that answer the question, mate, if you could? Yeah. Go on. How are we going to increase public spending by having less money to spend? Hello? 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 How are we going to increase public spending by having less money to spend? No, you're missing the point, James. Oh, the, the, must the situation be it, mate. is, our country <laughs> is in a worse state than what it was 25 years ago. Yes, and, and it's about to get even worse, and it's your fault. It's 10.48. I, I sometimes wonder why I bother. I, I dropped one of the finest gags in the history of British radio earlier in the programme, and I don't think anybody noticed, apart from a couple of people on Twitter. I'm talking to poor old Clint, who's still um, waiting for his unicorn to be delivered, and it, it breaks my heart to hear decent people like that still enthralled to the liars and the charlatans like uh, Johnson and Davis and Farage and the rest of them. But his name was Clint. So halfway through the conversation, in a sort of... Uh, Low voice aside, I said, you're really not making my day, Clint. Being, of course, a reference to the most famous catchphrase of the most famous Clint of all time, make my day, punk. And then nobody noticed. I don't know why I bother. Speaking of famous phrases, um, every time I find something on the internet, especially on Twitter, that looks brilliant, and I retweet it, someone comes back to me and says, that's not real. So I started checking, and I didn't check this one, because if this one isn't real, I'm going home, all right? This is the legend, the late legend. Christopher Hitchens, which kind of sums up, I can't believe I've never seen it before, sums up everything, and it's worth pointing out it comes from 1992, so although it references Trump, it was at a point where the idea of him ending up in the White House would still have prompted fits of laughter rather than fear. Um, this is Hitchens in 1992 writing for The Nation. Where did anyone get the brainless opinion that the super-rich are too wealthy to steal? Such naivety! From Ford to Hughes, from Iacocca to Trump... And other tycoon redeemers, we have the exact demonstration that nobody is more covetous and greedy than those who have far too much. The hitch, nailing it once again. And who bankrolled Brexit? The covetous and greedy who already have far too much. What's that? You own the Daily Telegraph and the Ritz, but, but you want to live in a low-regulation, low-taxation economy because you don't think you're rich enough. Okay, fine, yeah. Give a column to Johnson. Stick Farage on the opinion pages every other week. That's great, yeah. And, and I'll tell you what, you're so powerful and so rich that when you start claiming that you're somehow anti-elite despite owning the actual Ritz, the British public will have been so successfully gaslit and groomed that they'll swallow it. Where will it lead, James? Well, I've been telling you for two and a half years where it would lead. It will lead to a point where we find ourselves today. Either you now put your hands up, like the last fella did with the space not race line. You put your hands up and say, I don't care if we're poorer, as long as there are fewer foreigners. I'm not a racist, it's all about spacist. Or you do what the earlier caller did, Clint, who didn't make my day. All right, I'll drop it now. You should have laughed more, though. You do what Clint does and say, I believe, I still believe there's something better. What is it? Can't tell you. It's all your fault. What? And that's it. And, and if you're going to put your hands up and say, I don't mind being poorer, as long as there's a chance of fewer foreigners being around, I don't know what word you would use to describe yourself, but I kind of know what word I would use. Silly. Darren is in Woking. Darren, what would you like to say? 
Hi, James. Good morning. Hello, mate. Um, hello. I'm a Brexiteer. Um, I haven't had the guts to call you in the last two and a half years, so I'm completely honest. That's we have right. spoken previously, but not about Brexit. I've missed you, Darren. Um, yeah, you, likewise. I've tried listening most days, because it's important to even if you disagree. Well, but you're still so, a Brexiter, so... Yeah. I don't get that, to I be am. honest. Well, I was a massive EU supporter before the referendum was called. Right. I was a massive... I was the guy yeah. down the pub arguing against friends that would talk about immigration and all these Eastern Europeans, blah, 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 it would be me shutting it down saying, you're talking nonsense, you're talking rubbish, and I'm still of that view. Okay, sure. so Brexit is not about immigration but, to me. But you did vote leave. Correct. Right. Why, why, why the sound that that is incompatible, the two things I've just said? I, uh, because because right. you're still in favour of it now. I can understand why you would have done that at the time, because you thought that, that it would be possible to secure some sort of trading arrangement and somehow surrender and abolish freedom of movement. But now you know that it's impossible. I'm intrigued by why you're still on side, what it is you still believe. Well, the, 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 as, as immigration wasn't, wasn't a factor to me, it becomes an irrelevant point, doesn't it? Exactly. If, if you see what I mean. Exactly. Yeah. So all the so, other so points... let's take that out of the... Yeah. Yeah, OK. Now, look, I'm, I'm going to say a lot of things that you can rip apart, but, for instance, because there's a lot of things that I believe Brexit would deliver that I know we could have done as a member state of the EU. Again, right. Well, I don't I need to rip them apart, do I? That, well, I understand that's contradictory, but what there was one, I mean, we'll use the word belief, one part of my belief was that it would re reinvigorate our democracy in this country because I always thought that leaving the EU would create a lot of discussions about different things that we haven't talked about for decades as a nation, and that in theory should reinvigorate the conversation. For example? And maybe give us... Um, so, for instance, I would say things like... Um, state aid within within industry. So, for instance, if we, you, you, you know, like, again, I know the, the, the Germans are French. They own their railways and everything. So this isn't something we needed to leave the EU for. But by leaving, it creates a platform where we could talk as a nation whether we want to renationalise, yes. whether, you know, all of those things. So there's, there was a lot of what I voted for that was about value, potential Are, are value. you a bit Corbyn-y? Um... I'm, no, I'm, I'm a liberal left wing historically. Yes. And as a Brexiteer, and I've always felt quite aligned to you, and we've ended up, uh, sorry, it's a bit cheesy to say that, but we've it's ended fine. up on totally different paths. And I promise you, James, I have questioned my decision every single day. It, I, I've thought about nothing more important for the last two years. I've devoted as much time as I can I to I completely believe you, it. which is why I am genuinely intrigued by how you could still be on that side of the fence. Well, I'm going to throw something back at you. Now, you, you. You, over the last two, two and a half years, you started out by talking about how people hadn't informed themselves or they were misled or didn't understand, didn't listen. And what you've honed in, honed in on in the last six to eight, nine months, I'd say, yeah. is your criticism is that Brexiteers are believers, believe in Brexit, believe yes. in what we can achieve. My point to you, and I think this is such an important point, is you believe... The staying in the EU will all be okay. No. You believe that the pig economies won't drag down the currency. You believe that there probably won't be, or you believe there wouldn't be a European I army. Mentioned... I might have been words in your mouth. Well, you are. I, I, I yeah. mean, we have, as members... But you we... believe it will all be okay, James, no, saying, it's don't not, you? No, it's not a question of belief. I haven't mentioned the pig economies for two and a half years, so... No, 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 I am. I, I know you, you are, but you're, you're, telling you're telling me what I believe about... Be you're okay. telling me what I believe about something that I, I don't ever mentioned. So here's, okay. I, I suppose if you were, what you're trying to do is say, James, you believe stuff too. Yeah, okay. And what, yeah. What, okay, so let me... Well, of course, let of me course I around. do, but so it's not, it's not my... What, what, okay, well, you can talk... What advantages do you see of leaving the EU, James? Same, what advantages do you see that we will gain as a nation by leaving the EU? I mean, surely you can't be as binary as uh, great to stay... Terrible to leave. What, you know, <laughs> I think Please of, elaborate. I'm having a think. I'm going to be. About? I'm already late for the news, so don't, 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 don't get the hump when I have to move along. I'm going to give it a few sec, a few, a genuine benefit of leaving the European Union. In in, in what context? Under the what? terms of the deal that Theresa May has no, achieved, or in no. some fantasy deal that hasn't been agreed? No, don't, don't. See, don't do the derogatory. Fantasy. It's not derogatory, no, Darren. Do, there do, is, there do, is do reality that. It, no, Darren, mate, I've given you so many cracks of the whip, but you, you, you don't get you to. Haven't. Well, I have, my friend. What word would you use to describe a deal that doesn't exist? I'll use your word. I won't use fantasy, all right? So the question I'm asking you is, do you want me to respond to your question from the context of reality, or do you want me to answer it in the context of something that hasn't happened, which I have called fantasy and you don't like? So what word would you prefer? I would like you to respond to it based on where we were 
before Article 50 was invoked, but after the vote to leave. Right. Were there opportunities where we could have created better situations for our nation? I think there were. The I, the I, I think there were, up to and including the point at which freedom of movement was non-negotiable. So if freedom of movement was staying on the table, I think you can make a case, and some people are, for an EFTA-type arrangement, which would... No way, exactly. Which would... Yeah, but... Exactly. but no, Darren, Darren not exactly. Darren, freedom of movement was never, ever, ever going to be taken off the table, and there would have been no Brexit without the weaponisation of freedom of movement. I, you again, knew this. You, you're the one that I, says this in the pub, no, man. <laughs> James, I agree. Right. But, but what a Brexit, what the Brexiteers didn't understand that what it opened up to is there would be a conversation over the next 10 years about a fair immigration system. And over the, the next 10 years? Won. We haven't talked about anything else for the last 10 years. I'm, I'm, I'm late for the break. Thank, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're talking again, Darren. I've missed you, my friend. But uh, come on. The idea that we could have done Brexit without abolishing freedom of movement? Neither of us honestly believe that handed a suspended sentence for the attack in Croydon in South London in May. It was caught by a dash cam and the footage went viral. Sadiq Khan says he wouldn't normally criticise judges but is making an exception here. I've seen the video. I saw it again yesterday. I was scared watching it so I can only imagine what the person inside the car must have felt when somebody's not simply brandishing a zombie knife but using it in a threatening way banging the uh, window. I don't understand how it's possible for somebody in these circumstances to receive a suspended uh, sentence. And Mr Khan says he's going to write to the Justice Secretary about the case. The Care Quality Commission has rated a mental health trust as inadequate for the third time since 2015. The watchdog found significant concerns when it inspected Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Foundation Trust in September. Records show patients have harmed themselves while waiting to be seen. The trust says action is being taken to address concerns. A fire has caused a widespread power cut at two hospitals in Southampton. Relatives are being asked not to visit Southampton General and Princess Anne hospitals to allow staff to care for patients during the power failure. The A&D ward is only taking the most urgent cases. Sir Elton John has been forced to postpone a sold-out concert in Florida due to an ear infection. Fans in Orlando were already in their seats last night when they were told the singer wouldn't be able to perform. The show will be rescheduled in the near future. The LBC Markets report a short time ago the FTSE 100 was trading flat at 70.16. The pound buys $1.27 and €1.13. LBC weather, milder but very wet and windy. Gales affecting much of the north and west. The rain will be heaviest over Scotland and Northern Ireland at a high of 15 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Simon Conway. Orange, definitely orange, but white looks great. Right, optional extras, interest. Buying a car can be complicated, but at Sayat, thanks to Easy Move, just pick your trim, engine and colour with metallic paint as standard. That's it. And from November 1st to December 3rd, we're making things even easier at the Sayat Easy Move event. We're offering four years 0% APR finance across the range, plus £500 off the list price when you download a voucher. We can't help you choose a colour, but we can help you make the easy move. Register for downloadable voucher online cannot be used with any other voucher with Solutions Personal Contract Plan. Minimum 10% customer deposit required for a Tekka and Alhambra. No minimum deposit on all other models. 18 plus subject to status. Excludes Cooper and Taraco. Indemnities may be required. Sayat Financial Services. Visit sayat.co.uk. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. It is six minutes after 11 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC where, oddly, although it may not feel this way to people listening at home, uh, there's been a massive outbreak of agreement and consensus with regard to Brexit. Best highlighted by the fact that Philip Hammond keeps talking about Theresa May's deal. It's very much the Prime Minister's deal because Philip Hammond, as, a, as an accountant, would not be able to comprehend the idea that anyone would choose to be poorer. Theresa May understands it because she understands jingoism. So she thinks that people are prepared to be poorer if they are persuaded that it might mean there are a few foreigners around. She gets that. Hammond doesn't. I get it. I hate it. But it's true. That's where we are now. Either you are reduced to claiming as the dribble runs down your chin that there is something better out there, you just can't tell anybody what it is yet, or you acknowledge Theresa May's deal is the best of a bad lot, not as good as what we've currently got, but delivers the abolition of our freedom to move and 
work wherever we want in 27 other countries. And that's a great thing to do because it might mean there are fewer foreigners at the bus stop this time next year. And that's all it ever was. All the talk of sovereignty and, and uh, control and fish and blue passports, all it ever was, was the idea that I'll do anything to reduce the number of foreigners. Except it's not even that, is it? It's not reducing the number of foreigners at the bus stop. It's I voted to leave the European Union in the hope that there will be fewer articles in the Daily Mail about how awful foreigners are, because all the foreigners I know seem fine. Which is why, on the, after the referendum, I had to go up to them all at work and say, oh, I didn't mean you. I had to go up to all the parents in the playground of children from European Union countries. Some of them went to school uh, very upset and confused, wondering whether they were going to have to somehow leave the only home they'd ever known. They still don't have certainty, of course. But uh, this is why. They, oh, we didn't mean you. So who did you mean? Oh, I meant the ones I've never met. The ones that Paul Dacre keeps telling me about that are going to steal all my onions and my biscuits and my conkers and are undermining British values. What sort of British values? Well, you know, rule of law. But the Daily Mail called High Court judges enemies of the people. All right, not, not that British value. Uh, parliamentary sovereignty? Yeah, but the Daily Mail called... Elected MPs, saboteurs who needed to be crushed. Oh, all right, not that British value. What British value, though? Uh, academic freedom. Yeah, but the Daily Mail had a front page that said, our Remainer University, suggesting that academics shouldn't be free to arrive at their own conclusions as a result of their lifelong research. They should just do what the Daily Mail editor wants them to do. So there are your British values. Rule of law and an independent judiciary. Enemies of the people. Academic freedom, independent... <laughs> universities. Our Remainer universities. And parliamentary sovereignty consisting of elected representatives sent to Westminster to act in what they consider to be the best interests of their constituents. Crush the saboteurs. But he's gone now. He's sitting upstairs twiddling his thumbs and polishing his brogues. So... There won't be the same stories designed to terrify. The Sun will still be doing it with the devout Catholic Tony Gallagher at the helm. Love thy neighbour, turn the other cheek, unless they're foreign. Uh, but the mail won't. So all of these foreigners that we voted to reduce the numbers of, but we don't actually know and haven't met, because all the ones that we know at work or at school or wherever, they're great, and we don't, don't mean them. Where's the reduction going to take place? I don't know. But it doesn't matter, because it's worked. I will be happy to be poorer if I think there might be fewer foreigners around. Brexit finally boiled down to the bare essentials that it always, always had to be. 03456060973. Gethin is in Canterbury. Gethin, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Uh, good to speak to you. Uh, so, uh, I've worked at a language school for about seven years or so. Yes. I volunteered there for two years between the ages of 16 and 18 uh, and then started working getting paid for it between the 18, ages of 18 and 22 Lovely. Um, and I worked over the summers um, and I, in 2012 um, obviously we had the London Olympics and so sort of Britain was open for business and we're quite happy to welcome foreign people into the country um, and what I noticed over the years of working there is that the kind of instances I noticed racial kind of abuse either directed towards the students or, you know, directed to members of the well, What sort of thing? I, I don't swear, but give us an indication of what, what you would have not encountered previously that you did start stumbling over post-referendum. Uh, well, I only started... Uh, I finished working there in 2016, so unfortunately I don't have a post-referendum. Oh, OK. Uh, so it was the increase, the, the pre-referendum stoking up of fears and prejudices. Yeah. So um, I, there was one one instance in the West End where I was taking a bunch of students um, walking through and just a bloke on a motorbike just kind of cycles through and then just shouts the N-word at someone in, you know, a member of the public. And that's in front of the students. The N-word? Uh, yeah. And that's broad daylight. But that, that was happening in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. I, I, I'm not being the devil's advocate. We don't know that yeah, that was in any way linked to referendum-related rhetoric, do we? Of course, we don't. But my point is, it's yeah. more the number, of, the instances of this sort of stuff is increasing, and it's people feel like they're more able to get away with it. Yes. I suppose there's another instance um, that happened in Canterbury. Actually, I was meeting a, a bunch of students, and it was about three o'clock in the afternoon, and some poor woman, quite drunk, obviously. Mm. 
starts hurling racial abuse at the students. And he's a sort of 14-year-old, um, you know, Spanish students, yeah. girls. Speaking Spanish, just, presumably, otherwise she wouldn't have known to abuse them. Yeah, of course, yes. She's um, trying to remember the name of the bloke who objected to foreigners speaking foreign on trains despite having two German daughters who speak German to their German mum. But it's, it's just eluded me for the moment. You carry on, Gethin. Um, well, yes. And so, obviously, this woman was kind of taken away by her friends and, mm. you know, they're profusely apologising because people still realised that, that was the wrong thing to do. However, it's, I feel like now, post-referendum, it's kind of at that stage where it's now acceptable. But I don't know. People are, I've certainly noticed from my own personal experience, people are a lot more happy to actually be more overtly racist and actually talk to people and actually have conversations which are based on racial kind of discrimination. So, and the idea that that will somehow be diluted or go away after we've left the European Union with a deliberate intention to make ourselves poorer is is where all the sort of cheekiness and I, fun I, on today's programme disappears. Because the, the I, I, I think if, if, if we were to leave the European Union, you would see, firstly... European Union nationals leaving the country, which, fine, they're already doing that. Um, so you'd have, you know, the ethnically different, ethnically challenged people of this country are going to be even more of a minority. So that you're kind of going to, I think you're going so to the, see more. So the sight of brown kids getting their heads kicked in on school playing fields in Yorkshire is going to increase, not decrease, because, well, it turns out it wasn't all the fault of Polish plasterers that I'm angry and frightened all the time, so I need to now blame it on someone else. And I'm incorrigible yeah. goes further. And says so once people realise that European mm. Union membership isn't why they've had their pockets picked by billionaires, but they've... Mm fallen for the lies and the rhetoric of the billionaires and the people they sponsor in the media like Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage then uh, then we move into the rhetoric of send them back where they came from in the belief that that might possibly deliver this mythical dreamland that they remain convinced exists yes well quite and um, I also have another kind of experience and this is something so I believe that the solution out of this whole turmoil would be to have a second referendum yeah However, I feel that the minority that is doing this for racial reasons will will be opening Pandora's box, and will be it'll be a lot more severe in the next time round. It can't get worse. It. It's just timings. Uh, I, so I'm in favour of a, of another referendum. I'm not massively optimistic about what the result will be, and if it's as close as the last one, regardless of which way it goes, it, it, it would arguably. Um, uh, make things worse, not better. But I, I, but I genuinely and passionately, and to go back to, to, to the caller just before the 11 o'clock news, I believe, because we all believe stuff, I just don't allow arguments to take place between people who know stuff versus people who believe stuff. But my belief, which I can't currently prove, is that the best course of action for the country is to call the whole thing off, regardless of whatever ructions and rumpuses that might cause in the short term. But I could be wrong about that. The stuff I'm not wrong about is the stuff that's written down, like the Good Friday Agreement, like the Constitution of the European Union, like the rules of freedom of movement. So if people come on the programme and misrepresent stuff that's actually written down, then they will be interrupted. People come on and admit that this is just an opinion, and I can't back it up, and the evidence is currently against me, then they'll be sort of politely tolerated for a moment, but I want facts and evidence, and there is no fact or evidence to support the idea that we're going to be better off out of the European Union. There isn't even any forecast or projection that says so, except the stuff that Jacob Rees-Mogg peddles without mentioning that his economic guru thinks that agriculture and industry will be completely obliterated. So even the bloke standing up saying, we'll have cheaper shoes for the poor, even he, in brackets, fails to add, according to a bloke who also says agriculture and industry will be completely decimated. But I'm heavily invested in emerging funds, countries that are currently very poor but have raw materials. My investors are making a fortune out of them, and you don't need to be in the European Union to make a bunch of moolah out of mines in Africa. Oh, by the way, you'll have cheap shoes, plebs. I mean, I mean it's odd, given that the thing that has caused the consensus and uh, a sense, oddly, of relief for me is, is nation damaging, deliberate damage of our own nation. But at least I, I no longer have that vague f hope, because it's not the despair that gets you, it's the hope. 
So I don't have that vague hope in the back of my mind that maybe the emperor will turn out to have been wearing a flesh-coloured body stocking all along. And my insistence, increasing insistence over two and a half years that he is stark rollock naked um, might yet prove not to be true. We all now know that it is true. There, there are only two camps left on Brexit. The one that says, yes, we will be worse off, but it's worth it because fewer foreigners. And the one that says, oh, it could all have gone so differently, but I can't tell you how. The believers and the xenophobes. That's it. The cultists, actually. And the honest xenophobes, because an awful lot of the people pretending to be cultists are actually dishonest xenophobes. And there it is. So, I mean, that's it. That's it, the end. Here we are. Where we would always have had to end up from the moment Article 50 was prematurely triggered and the Good Friday Agreement smashed into the red lines of Theresa May's rhetoric and, more pertinently, the four freedoms of the European Union. That it was always going to end like this. So you're left with either... I mean, who do you respect more? The people who are honest enough to say, I don't mind if I'm poorer as long as foreigners suffer more? Or the people who are still pretending... It's, 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 you know, in terms of honesty... It's quite easy to make an argument to say that the, the xenophobes, the people who, who think that making life even worse for foreigners is uh, so desirable that they don't mind suffering a diminishment in their own existence, there's an honesty to that bigotry that is lacking from the believers, the people claiming that the unicorns are still coming. Honest racist. What would you rather have, an honest racist or, or, a, or a dishonest cultist? I don't know. There, finally, is a Brexit-related question that I haven't got an answer to. 22 minutes after 11 is the time. Take this up to half past, I think. Thank you to everyone who's rung in. We could, of course, carry on with this conversation until a week next Thursday or possibly even April the 1st, 2019. But um, variety is the spice of life. I'd really like to talk about terror, like fear, abject fear, a story about a hang glider that I'll share with you shortly. I don't know why it's touched some of my most primitive emotions and feelings. I always fancied hang gliding. I used to be really brave as a kid. Or was I just foolish? I often wonder whether childlike bravery is actually a failure of imagination. So you haven't actually imagined how wrong things can go. And when you become a parent and you start when your child disappears for 17 seconds and you think they've been abducted into the white slave trade and the heart is going at 100 miles an hour and the sweat is breaking out on your brow after 16 seconds, that's when your imagination makes you fearful and frightened of stuff. So I don't even like roller coasters anymore. You couldn't get me off the roller coaster as a kid. I once went, because when you're at private school, you have different school holidays to state schools. I once went to West Midland Safari Park during the bit of the school holidays that were privately educated kids exclusively. So everyone else had gone back to school. I went to West Midland Safari Park and sat on the Cobra for an entire day. I didn't get off it because there wasn't any cues. You could sit on it, you could stay on it and go round and round again. And the Cobra was a quality roller coaster. West Midland Safari Park, I grant you, is not Alton Towers or Thorpe Park, but it had a cracking little theme park of its own. It still does. Pirate ship. I wouldn't go on a pirate ship now. I used to rush for the back of the pirate ship. You remember school trips, Alton Towers? There's no point going on the pirate ship if you're not at the very back. And the thrill of the pirate ship was the genuine fear that you were going to fall out. At the top of that swing, you'd be genuinely fearful because you'd be pushing your feet to the floor and genuinely thinking you were going to fall out. I don't know. I digress slightly. It's 11.24. Andy is in Leicester. Andy, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi, James. Good morning. Hello, mate. Um, James, just regarding uh, your commentary with, um, you know, the sort of immigration side of things, um, I don't think that's quite accurate on the fact that people voted to leave. I, I think most people obviously just want some sort of control coming into the country f for our public services, really. Yes, but but we had that already. Well, not with freedom of movement. I mean, there's no way you can control that. And, well, and there, have, there is, know, specific actually. Numbers. There is, actually. And how's that done? Well, you read the Citizens' Charter and you learn that in order to move into a member state, you have to uh, demonstrate that you have sufficient material wealth not to become a burden upon the social service providers of that state. And if you haven't found mm -hmm. employment after three months, you can be required to leave. Uh, but, but that still leaves a three-month window, I suppose. And, you know, I think the point Say is... Say that again. Say that again, Andy. Does that leave a window of three months for, for right. people just to come yeah. and... 
um, um, Look I think for a job for three months. You just said that out, out loud on national radio, mate. So we're banning holidays now, are we? <laughs> no, I get your point with that. What I'm saying is I think people are just concerned that we've got... It doesn't appear that we had any controls... So why are these people in. in the channel at the moment risking their lives in dinghies if it's easy just to waltz through the borders, mate? It's a fair point. I just think that... Well, you need of... to answer it because it's a response to your point. Well, my point... What I found him to say was that obviously, I think for a lot of people, perhaps the decision came on uh, the fact that, you know, they can't get into a lot of the public services that they need. And I think they felt that maybe that was because they're under pressure with. Uh, yeah, you know, but that's not actually what you say, because if you had said that, I'd ask you which public service you've been denied access to and whether or not you thought that a swinging round no. of cuts since the year 2010 might have had more to do with a diminishment of service everywhere from the police to the NHS than the population of people that relies upon the police and the NHS, regardless of their geographical origins. And then I'd have referred you to the number of people born elsewhere who work within the NHS and the police and sure. social care and all the other areas of employment that are considered in some ways to be at the bottom of the ladder and undesirable for some native-born Britons. And then I'd remind you that you've just said on national radio, well, maybe three months is too long, which means you're in favour of abolishing holidays. <laughs> no, I like holidays, believe me. Well, but, uh, no, there's, there's no, cognitive just... dissonance. I want to ban holidays, but I really like them. <laughs> well, that's that's just why I think that a lot of people have, uh, you know... Really, I'm sure you're off. right, but they're idiots. You can see that now. <sighs> well, maybe not informed properly, but... Uh... Well, yeah, not, not just not informed that properly, because that, that's forgivable. Then I point out to them that they're not informed properly, and they still argue from a position of ignorance. What choice do we have but to call them idiots, Andy? Well, I'll, I'll take your point. <laughs> I'll take your point on that. But tomorrow you'll still call yourself a Brexiter, right? I, well, I am, yes, I am. I, I, you know, and there it is. It all. There it is, mate. Right there. Everything you've said <laughs> pulled to shreds on national radio. You've ended up arguing against holidays, and you still think you're on the right side of this decision, but you haven't got a scooby doo as to why. <laughs> Except, forgive Thank me, mate, but you said it. Too many foreigners. No, I didn't. I didn't say that. Well. I think, for, I think I think I agree with you. People coming into the national, we need to. Kind of did, need. Andy. I'm losing you a bit. Okay, so what is your reason for wanting to leave the European Union if it's not oh. too if it's not too many foreigners? <laughs> Bless him. It's coming up to half past eleven. You're listening to Joe. Oh, I'm, hang on, I'm, I'm losing you a little bit there. Can't quite. But that that that's the question, isn't it? Why why would you still? Having just done that on national radio, why would you still think that you're on the right side? Reduced to pretending that the phone line has gone down. I, I bear him no ill will. I bear him no malice. His life will not get better after we leave the European Union. He will be worse off. If there are fewer foreigners around, then according to most economic analysis, he'll be even more worse off than he would be if there wasn't, because foreigners are customers. It's the cab drivers. I sit there. They bend my ear on Brexit, often politely. And I say, so you voted to have fewer customers, did you? I thought business was bad at the moment, lads. Oh, I didn't vote to have fewer customers. Well, you, you kind of did. First bloke to tell me he was leaving Britain after that referendum result came in was a city banker, a German city banker. Actually, he was Dutch, but he was moving to Germany. He gets a taxi, a black cab to work on the, on the radio taxis every single morning from Chiswick to the city. What's the fare on that? He doesn't even use Addison Lee. I don't know why. He's gone already. Kids are at the same school as my kid. He's gone. You voted for him to leave. What are you voting for? Fewer customers, less money, declining wealth, poorer economy. Why? Foreigners, James. Really? Is that all you've got? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm losing you. The phone line's going down. Go, click. And we will move on. I'll just read this out because I do take constructive 
criticism seriously. Um, I, I take unconstructive criticism <laughs> back up to the office upstairs and show it to <laughs> colleagues as an example of just how bonkers some corners of social media can be. But but this is Matt. Listen, mate. I don't. I can't check the time on this. I think you said it at the end of the call. He says, I wish you'd go a bit easier on people like Andy. They're not bad people. Often they're not stupid people either. They've just had year after year of anti-EU propaganda poured into their heads by the same billionaire media moguls who stand to benefit most from Brexit. Obviously, I agree with that. And I, I am at great pains with people like Andy, who was decent but wrong, not to uh, go full um, uh, rager. But what did I say to him at the end of the conversation, mate? After I'd shown him that he'd been led into that position of abject ignorance by propaganda and falsehoods, I said, you're still going to be a Brexiter tomorrow, aren't you? So he's reduced to arguing against holidays on live national radio and then pretending that there's something wrong with his phone line because all of the things he thought were true weren't true, which you're right, can seem a little brutal, but the crucial crux, the point was... You're going to go away still thinking you're right, aren't you? And he was so honest that he said yes. And there's my life for the last two and a half years. <laughs> Except, of course, I know that there's an awful lot of people for whom the needle does move. Um, just not necessarily in the course of the actual phone call. So I take your point, Matt, but I don't necessarily agree with it wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm.